Good morning. This is Neil Paulhemus. I want to welcome you all to today's webinar. Uh, the title of today's webinar is a collection of new procedures for data visualization. Uh, every time we come out with a new version of Stack Graphics, we try to add at least a handful of new methods for visualizing data. Obviously, with the name of the product, Stat Graphics, and um, I've been interested in it from the very beginning in ways that we can um, display data visually. And I have a number that I'd like to uh, to show you today. Um, as uh, always, you can submit questions using the GoToWebinar facility. Uh, I will be watching uh, that the questions you submit uh, to try to pick up any technical problems if there are any. Uh, otherwise, I'll answer whatever questions you submit uh, after I spend probably about a half an hour showing you some of these new graphical procedures. All right. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at basically six different procedures um, that have been introduced in version 19. In version 19.1, uh, which is the one that we released back last fall, uh, there were waterfall plots, actually three different varieties of waterfall plots, uh, each designed for a different type of data. Um, there's what I call a missing data plot, which makes it easier to find out where in your data set you might have missing values, and also the addition of lines to bar charts. Now, all three of those were requested by um, version 18 users, requested that we add them to version 19. And I'll show you an example of each of those with a particular data set uh, that I think works well. We re recently released version 19.2. Uh, that's um, an automatic upgrade replacement for 19.1. And there we introduced three new dynamic plots. Uh, we introduced a dynamic Pareto chart uh, a spiral time series plot, and a dynamic radar spider plot. And again, I'm going to show you an example of each of those on some very interesting data sets. Now, just to comment about version 19.2 before I get on with the, the main webinar here. We released uh, version 19.2, back on the 10th of March. Um, if you have version 19.1 now, you can just go to our website and install 19.2 right over the top of 19.1. You won't have to reactivate or do anything other than run the installation program. What it's done is added five new procedures to version 19. The first three on my list here are the ones I'm going to be showing you today. Um, the dynamic Pareto chart, the spiral plots, and the dynamic radar plot. We also added, though, two analytical procedures. We added the ability to fit mixtures of non-normal distributions. That's something I promised in an earlier webinar when we talked about fitting normal mixtures that I'd look around and see what we could implement with respect to non-normal distributions. And in fact, um, that uses our interface with R. And you have a choice there of log normal, Weibull, or gamma distributions as each part of the mixture. Um, at some point in the future, I'll uh, show you that during one of the webinars. We also added a new procedure using our Python interface for support vector machines. Now, support vector machines are 
supervised machine learning algorithms. It can be used either for classification, where you're trying to determine uh, what class a particular observation belongs to, or for regression, where you're trying to actually make a numeric prediction. Uh, I'll definitely do a webinar in the future talking about the support vector machines and uh, how we've implemented that interface to Python. Okay, just wanted you to know that this was out there uh, so uh, you could try uh, those new procedures. Now, the first um, visualization procedure we're going to look at today will be the waterfall plots. Now, there are three different types of waterfall plots. The first is something called an ordered waterfall plot. And what that will basically do is take a column of data, and the column we'll be plotting here is going to be change, and create something like a Pareto chart in the sense that it will sort the data from largest to smallest and give you a plot that ends up looking like a waterfall. Now, this is a, a set of data, and I'll give you the reference for this at the end of the webinar where they had taken various patients who had some sort of a tumor and applied, gave each one of those patients a treatment. And after a period of time, they looked at the percent change in the size of the tumor. So what you have here is you have the patient numbers, the percent change in the size of the tumor, and a category. Each of the patients, patients was also put in a particular category. And the, there are codes like PD, I think that was progressive disease. Uh, I don't remember what all the codes are, but there were five different categories. Now, the data input for an ordered waterfall plot looks like this. You give it first the column with the data that you want to plot. Okay, and that has to be a numeric variable. You then specify a label of some sort. In this case, the patient number is going to be the label. And then an optional code, in this case, category, that will be used to color each of the bars. Okay. Well, this is what happens if you take that oncology data and make a waterfall plot, an ordered waterfall plot. What you can see is it's taken the data, it's sorted change from largest to smallest. Okay, now obviously we were hoping that the tumor would shrink, so negative is good. However, there were cases uh, where unfortunately the tumor got larger. And this is, again, percent change. Now, by coloring the categories, you can see that certain categories like PD, I think that stood for progressive disease, uh, were quite hard to treat. We weren't very successful on those categories. On the other hand, in the PR category and the CR category, uh, you see there were some dramatic reductions in the size of the tumor. There's also been a target line of a reduction of 30% in the size of the tumor drawn on that particular plot. Now, it's not a complicated plot mathematically, but there's quite a bit of information in that plot. And obviously, it does look somewhat like a waterfall. Now, it's called order because the data have been sorted from, in this case, largest to smallest. Another type of waterfall plot would be a sequential waterfall plot. A sequential waterfall plot is typically used for things like income statements. And this is the income statement for a fictitious bookstore. You see at the top in row one, uh, an item labeled gross revenue. 
And in this case, the bookstore had a gross revenue of a little over $245,000. There were adjustments to that of about minus $2,400, leaving a net revenue of about $243,000. You then see various types of expenditures, inventory, merchandising, other sales costs, and so forth. And you also see some positive values like gross income. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna plot this data and we're gonna want to differentiate between revenue, expenditures, and certain items that are totals. Something like net revenue here is gross revenue minus the adjustments. And you can see there's a column on the right-hand side which labels this as a total. Okay, now the data input dialog box for this uh, looks like this. You can see that you need to give it first off a column with numeric data. And in this case, that's amount. You give it a column with labels. In this case, it's item. And then also a column labeled total. Total, you might have seen, I guess I didn't really mention it, is an indicator column here. If it's a total, you have a one. If it's an expenditure or an income, uh, it's labeled zero. All right. Now, Let's see what the waterfall plot looks like on this particular data. It's basically sequential. Starting from the left with gross revenue, you see a large green bar. That is an increase in the amount of money uh, to the bookstore. You then see some red bars. Each of those represents a decrease and occasionally you'll see a total things like net revenue and gross income and so forth and they're shown in gray um, now there could be more than one increase this is a fairly simple uh, sequential waterfall plot but it does show that particular simple income statement at least i think in a, in a nice visual way okay now that's the sequential waterfall plot. There's a third waterfall plot, which is, I think, even more interesting. And we've called it a three-dimensional waterfall plot. A three-dimensional waterfall plot is designed to display data contained in a two-way table. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a two-way table basically has rows representing one categorical factor and columns representing another categorical factor. What you're looking at here is data on the median income of people living in the United States. Now, each row represents a year starting in 1967. Each column represents an age category. 15 to 24 years old, 25 to 34 years, all the way up to 65 and older. And all the data have been normalized, they've been normalized to $2017. Okay, now to represent this data, uh, I've called up the three-dimensional waterfall plot. Where it asks for data, I've given it the names of the columns that have the data. And where it asks for a row category, I've given it year. And what it's going to do is it's going to create a plot that looks like this. Um, basically, what you see is planes. In this case, there's a plane representing each age category. And basically, you can see that over time, particularly as we get to 2020, in all the age categories, the median income uh, appears to have gone up. Now, let me actually switch over to stack graphics for a moment because there's some options here. 
So now I've actually switched away from PowerPoint over to the three-dimensional waterfall plot. What's interesting here, of course, is that you can use the sliders to uh, get a, a better view of it. There are other options though too. If I press the right mouse button and go to analysis options, there are a number of things I can tell it to do. One, I can ask it to switch rows and columns. Now, rather than having a plane for each age category, I have a plane for each year. And I think you can see if you look, let me get up top a little bit, that maximum median income appears to come in for the 45 to 54 age category, although it's also quite close to the 55 to 64. From younger ages, there's a fairly steady gain and has been over the entire time period. And then, of course, it falls back off in uh, 1965. Okay. I can also go to analysis options and ask it to draw panes parallel to the y-axis rather than the x-axis. And now we're back to the original example that I showed you with a plot a plane for each age category, uh, but sometimes it's easier to see it this way than it might be from the other way. Well, those are our three interesting plots that were in version 19.1. They're called waterfall plots. All right, back to PowerPoint. Another plot that I wanted to show you is a plot of missing data. Someone, um, a version 18 user, uh, indicated to me that it was sometimes difficult to know if you had a data file loaded into a data sheet where missing values might occur. So I put in the data viewer a missing value plot. And what you can see here, I have for this example loaded the file called 93 cars, which has information about 93 different makes and models of automobiles. And uh, specified in the columns field over here that I wanted to look at each of the columns. Now what the missing data value plot looks like is this. It's basically a grid where I have rows for each observation in the spreadsheet and columns for each column. And what we have done is we have filled in, darkened any cell where there is missing data. Now this obviously doesn't work very well on very large data sets, but it works pretty nicely on a data set like uh, 93 cars. You can quickly see, for example, that there's one missing value in the cylinders column. There are two missing values in the rear seat column and a handful of missing values in the luggage column. Not a very complicated plot, but I appreciated the fact that something like that, a quick a view of where the missing data might be in a spreadsheet um, could be an interesting plot, even though we're really plotting non-data, right? Missing data. Not too complicated, but it could be useful. Another uh, addition to version 19.1, which maybe wasn't very complicated, but does add a lot, is the ability to put a line on a bar chart. You know, in stack graphics, we do uh, simple bar charts and multiple bar charts. Uh, the suggestion here was, you know, sometimes I have another variable that I'd like to plot on top of the bars. Could we do an implementation of that? Uh, so what we did is we took both the simple and the multiple bar chart procedures and added as an option, <clears throat> the ability to put another variable on the plot. 
Now, what I have here, the data that I'll, I'll show you in just a second, is information about the weather in Washington, D.C. And there are four columns. The first column is month, okay, January through December. The second column is hours of daylight on the 20th of the month. Uh, I guess they picked a particular year for this. And it shows, for example, in January, there are slight, there's slightly less than 10 hours of daylight on the January 20th, all the way up to almost 15 hours on June 20th. And then we have two columns showing the high temperature and the low temperature averaged in that particular month. Uh, and in this case, degrees Fahrenheit. Now, what I want to do in terms of making a plot is to make a standard bar chart with the high temperatures and the low temperatures. Okay, that we could do before. It's very useful. Um, but what I wanted to do, and you can see it down toward the bottom here, was to allow us to take an additional variable like hours of daylight and put it on top of the bars. Okay, what you get is I think a fairly nice looking plot. All right, you can see here as a bar the high and low temperature uh, in uh, each month in Washington DC. Okay, and the scale for the bars is on the left-hand side, degrees Fahrenheit. You also see a line superimposed on top of the bars showing hours of daylight, and the scale for that is on the right-hand side. Now, what's most interesting to see in this? Well, I think the most interesting thing to see, and I'm sure this won't surprise anybody, is that there's a correlation, fairly strong correlation, between hours of daylight and the temperatures, right? The interesting thing, maybe more interesting though, and again, not very surprising, those variables peak at different places, right? Hours of daylight, you can see peak right around here in June, whereas temperatures don't peak until July. Again, I'm sure you knew that before, but a chart like this uh, uh, makes that uh, quite obvious. So I thought I thought that was a neat suggestion. It wasn't hard to do, and you can do this on the, on single bar charts where you only have one variable, or you can do it on clustered multiple bar charts like this. Okay. Now those are all in 19.1. In 19.2 we went ahead and added three new dynamic procedures, dynamic visualization procedures. And if you're familiar with stat graphics, you know that we call these things statlets. And what they are is they are animated charts, typically showing how things have evolved over time. Now, the first one I'm going to show you is the dynamic Pareto chart. And I must admit, I didn't invent this. Somebody actually showed me this very neat website where someone had built a chart very similar to, to what I'm going to show you here. Uh, and it had to do with showing coronavirus data. And what I have in this spreadsheet, and incidentally, I'll give you these data files uh, after the webinar so you can try these your own, on your own. In this particular file, what we have is for every day, at least most days during 2020, um, the number of reported coronavirus cases and deaths in various countries throughout the world. Okay. And what I was interested in doing was showing how the number of cases and number of deaths 
changed over time in the countries that had the highest number of cases. Okay, so what I did is I created a dynamic Pareto chart. And this is what the data looked like. The primary data that I'll be plotting on this Pareto chart in just a second will be the cumulative number of reported COVID-19 cases in a particular country on a particular day, up to a particular day, it's cumulative, okay? I'm going to slice the data by date. The slicer is something you can change with a little slider bar. So we'll be able to see how things change over time. I'm going to use as the identifier region. Okay, that will be the name of the country uh, that I'm showing. And I'm going to color each of the bars based upon the cumulative number of deaths. How many people have died from COVID-19 or reportedly died at least from COVID-19 in a particular country up to a particular date? And now I've also made liberal use of the select field here. Select, you'll see that on every data input dialog box allows you to plot just a subset of the data instead of all the data. And what I've typed into the select field here is first off, date greater or equal to 3120. And there wasn't much of interest before that. So I, I just wanted to start my chart on March 1st. And then rather than plotting all 100 and 40 countries or however many there are, which made the chart pretty unreadable, I asked for it to plot just certain countries. I went through, found out what the top 20 countries were for COVID-19 cases. And I've typed into my select field here an expression that will pick those 20 countries. Now, what you can see, it says, right, date greater or equal to 3120. And whenever you put a date in, it has to be in double quotes, just like I did. Then I put the and sign, meaning that not only does the date have to be greater than March 1st, but one of the following things must be true. The code must be USA, code is another column in the file, or that vertical line means or, code equals Brazil, or code equals Mexico. And if you saw the whole thing, there are 20 codes there. Okay, now what it's going to produce is going to be a dynamic Pareto chart looking something like this. And what you see is that we've taken the 20 countries in the world that have the highest number of COVID-19 cases. You're seeing the data right now on December 14th, which happens to be the last day, unfortunately, in the, in the file that I found to plot, okay? At the top of the list is the United States. The United States had the most cases and the length of the bar represents, look at the x-axis, cumulative number of cases. That's followed by India, followed by Brazil, Russia, France, all the way down to Spain. Okay, I've also colored the bars according to the number of deaths. At that point in December in the US, there were nearly 300,000 deaths which was substantially more than any other country. Okay, well, that's a standard Pareto chart. Let's go over to stack graphics though, and uh, do this as a dynamic plot. So let me close off the current stat folio 
and call up my Pareto stat. Come on, Pareto Statlet. There we go. Okay. Now, what you're seeing here is the data at, on 12-14. I'm going to use the slider on the toolbar, though, and back the date back to March 1st. Because what I want you to see is how things have changed. Back in March 1st, there were very, very few cases. But you may recall at that point, Italy had the most cases. The United States was like sixth back on March 1st. Well, let me push this button here and let time start to change. Now, what's going to happen is you'll quickly see the United States and Spain move into first and second place above Italy. Okay. And um, we'll, we'll let this go here for a little while. And you can see things start to change. Okay, <clears throat> the United States starting to grow. And uh, uh, people changing places. Okay, this is going a little slower than it did before. Let me move my uh, go to webinar pane off the top of stack graphics. I'll probably make it go a little bit faster. Okay. Anyway, it's it's interesting to watch. You can see uh, how things change over time. Okay, there comes Mexico and Chile. Now India moves into third place. Oh, now things are starting to move a little more quickly. Uh, you can see not only the number of cases starting to grow in the United States, but you can see the colors start to change as we get more and more deaths. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting way, I think, to display data over time where you're looking at something like, um, you know, you, you want to do a Pareto chart and, and see who's in, who's in first place. I must have something going on in the background because it normally moves quicker than that. <laughs> All right, anyway, let's uh let me stop that for a moment and just move it up to the end. You can, you got the idea now. And by the time we get to December 14th, uh the United States is well ahead of the others. Some other th interesting things in this chart though I noticed. Look at India and Brazil. Brazil has a little more orange in it than India. That means that even though Brazil has fewer cases, they actually have more deaths than India. And you can also see for the rest of the countries, they're all pretty blue, except for Mexico. Mexico must have a relatively large proportion of deaths compared to cases. Anyway, I thought that was a pretty neat plot. All right. Well, let's go and look at a, another neat statlet. This one is a spiral time series plot. And the data that I'll be plotting in this case will be the data, the weather in Charlottesville, Virginia. There's a data file, and I'll post this on the website after the webinar, called Charlottesville Weather. And what it has in it for every month, starting in January 2008, has various information. The data I'm particularly interested will be in will be the maximum temperature during that month. 
and this is in um, in degrees centigrade. This is not Fahrenheit, obviously. Okay, but what we'd like to see is how the maximum temperatures change over time in Charlottesville. Okay, so um, what we will be creating um, will be a spiral plot. The data input looks like this. Data is maximum temperature. I'm going to plot it over time, and the time is in the column called month, and I'm going to color the bars, in this case, by year. And what the result is going to be, it's going to be a plot looking something like this, okay, where the data evolve over time. This actually starts right about here with January 2008, okay? And um, as you move from the inside out, you're basically following time. And I've set things up so that there are actually 60 bars each time around. So it's exactly five years. That way, the Januarys will line up and the Junes will line up and so forth. Okay. Well, let's see how this works in stack graphics if we do this dynamically. Let me open up the spiral plot stat folio. Okay. There's the time series spiral plot. Okay. That's at the very end. Let me go back here, though, to the beginning and let it evolve over time. All right, this one's moving at a good pace. Basically, each set of colors is a year, and you can see the temperatures rise in the summer and fall in the winter. Interesting. Now, if I push analysis, right mouse analysis options, this is where I've carefully defined the number of positions per spiral to be 60. That means five years, 60 months worth of data each time around. If you don't do that, things don't uh, line up seasonally as well as they do on this plot. You might find a use for that. It's sort of an interesting plot. And now finally, the, the last plot I want to show you is a dynamic radar spider plot. And in this case, what I'm going to display, and this is one of my favorites, is the amount of sea ice in the northern and southern hemisphere each month, starting back in 1979. So you can see that there's a column labeled year, a column identifying the hemisphere, okay, and there's a bunch of southern rows farther down in the file, and then a numeric value showing the amount of ice in that particular hemisphere in that month. Okay, now the way this works is basically I give it a set of data columns. In this case, case, 12 columns, one for each month. I'm going to ask the statlet to slice by year. So my slider on the statlet will be able to change the year. Okay. And um, I'll identify it by hemisphere. You'll see what that does in a second, but basically it'll give me a separate plot for each value of hemisphere. And then I've told it to select a year less than 2020 because the data was not complete for 2020. Well, what we're going to get is we're going to get a picture looking something like this. Okay, this is a standard, some people call it a radar plot, some people call it a um, spider plot. Basically, what you have is 
various spokes coming out from the center of the circle. And you can see the scale out here says zero to 20. If the sea ice was zero on a particular month, the point would be all the way in the middle of the circle. On the other hand, if the sea ice reached 20, the point would be all the way out on the circle, the outer circle. Well, this is the data for 2019. And you can see something interesting, a couple things. First off, it looks like the area of the blue region is less than the area of the red region. I guess there's less ice, sea ice in the Northern hemisphere than in the Southern hemisphere. On the other hand, the amount of ice seems to vary more in the Southern hemisphere. You can see that there are some months of the year where there's very little ice in the Southern hemisphere. And then other months like September where there's a very large amount of ice. So although there may be more ice on average in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the extremes are larger as well than they are in the Northern Hemisphere. All right, well, that's 2019. We want to make this more fun, though, by going to Stat Graphics and seeing how things changed over time. So let me open up my radar statlet. Okay, there's the plot we were looking at a moment ago, right? And I'll move it down a little bit here. That's for 2019. I'm going to take my slider, move it back to 1979. And now I'll let it change over time. It's changing from one year to the next. Well, what you can see is that there is, you know, a fair amount of fluctuation in the sea ice from year to year. Okay? It still looks like there's more in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere, but things did change. Now, watch this. I'm going to quickly change from 2019 back to 19, what was it, 68, something like that. Take a look at it in 2019. Now take a look at it in 1979. It was 79. 2019, 79. Obviously, there was more ice in the northern hemisphere back in 1979 than there is in 2019. Southern hemisphere doesn't seem to have changed that much, maybe a little bit. But there have definitely been some dramatic changes in the northern hemisphere. The ability to add some animation to the plot lets you see things that might be difficult to see in some other ways. Well, those are the procedures I wanted to show you today, uh, new procedures that we've added for visualizing data in version 19. Um, as I said, uh, the data files and also a recording of the webinar and also these PowerPoint slides will be placed um, on our website uh, as soon as, uh, well, sometime this afternoon. I did want to point out, though, where some of the data came from. Um, some of the sources did ask that they be acknowledged. First off, the oncology data that I used in the waterfall plot came from a uh, the proceedings of a journal back in, of, of a conference back in 2019. Median income data came from the Census Bureau. COVID-19 data came from the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Sea ice from the National Snow and Ice Data Center and the Charlottesville weather data from the National Oceanic and Administrative Center. Um, so those are the places that uh, the data came from. And uh, it's freely available on the internet. They just asked to be recognized. And as I said, we will have uh, the information placed here. Oh, 
I clicked on <laughs> I clicked on a link, didn't want to do that. We will put the saved webinar and the notes and the data files on our website at www.stackgraphics.com slash webinars. All right, any questions about what I showed? I did not see any, pretty much any questions come in along the way. That's unusual. Um, of course, this may have been a little bit more straightforward than some of the webinars. All right, well, there are no questions. So in that case, have a good day. Um, I will, in a few weeks, uh, give a um, uh, another type of webinar.